Hello, I hope you're doing well. My name's Ron Rambo Kim, and I've got an exciting interview for you today. I'm interviewing Timothy Ta Automatic. He's an elite Counter-Strike gamer. He also played Valorant at the highest level. Absolutely a tier one player. He was a top 20 player in one of the years when he was uh, in Cloud9. And they also won a CS major, the first major ever by a North American team. So he knows what it takes to be an elite player, what it takes to get there. He's played along some of the best players as well. And I actually had the chance to work with him as I coached Cloud9 for about eight months. So uh, I got to work with him day to day and understand his logic, his game theory, his work ethic, and just how he constructs himself to prepare himself to play these elite matches. So it's a long interview. We go through a lot of stuff. I ask some questions like how he got into gaming, who he thinks the smartest player he's ever played with, the clutchest player, um, his thoughts on flow state and much, much more. So uh, I just also want to preface this is my first interview where I'm actually interviewing someone instead of being the person that asks or answers the questions. So it's a skill set I definitely want to improve upon. So leave in the comments if there's anyone, a professional gamer, a streamer, someone in the gaming industry that you find interesting and the questions you would ask them and I'll see what I can do and see if we can have that conversation. So. Without further ado, I'll go ahead and play the chat that we had and hopefully you enjoy. The first thing is, I just wanna kinda go back in history and figure out how you got into gaming. Uh, I know a lot of professional gamers were competitive beforehand, they played various sports. Could you just talk about you know, what you were doing before gaming and what initially got you started? Yeah, I think I started off as a gamer. Um, what got me started was just, you know, my older cousin, he kind of, he was playing CS, I think 1.5 at the time, or 1.6, one or the other. And I would just go to his house on the weekends and he would, you know, let me play on his computer. So I would play uh, a bit and I was really bad. And that kind of made me want to keep playing. You know, we would play uh, FY Ice World or uh, gun games and I would just get destroyed. And then that it just made me want to keep playing. And then as soon as I would get a kill, it would feel like super good. So then I just kept, you know, trying to get that feeling. Um, and then uh, after that, I think also in the third grade, I was uh, I started playing basketball and then basketball kind of took over my life. So I stopped playing CS. Um, but yeah, I was like really competitive in basketball. I was on like travel teams. Um, I played at the rec center. Um, I played like on multiple divisions at the same time, you know, like my age group and then one age group above mine and then even two age groups above mine at times. So I was like really into basketball. And um, I think my dad was really helpful in that because he was always trying to help me get better. Like he was, I remember like as soon as I told him I wanted to play, he like took me to the library and then we bought or we rented a like DVD on how to shoot uh, like good proper shooting form. So yeah, I remember we like watched that, but um, yeah, that was kind of what I did beforehand was just like basketball. And um, yeah, I played third, fourth, I played all the way to high school. And then I kind of quit my sophomore year and I started wrestling. Mm. Um, was not that good at wrestling. I was kind of, uh, yeah, I would say that, like, I wasn't, like, scrappy enough. Like, I think in wrestling, you got to be really scrappy, and I just, like, wasn't. And, and, um, yeah, what do you I mean? Was... What do you mean by scrappy? Like, you just didn't have that dog in you? Like, because I know it's yeah, a rough kinda. sport. I mean, you're yeah, just well, manhandling each other. Like, yeah, it's okay. Brutal. Well, I think one thing is I started my sophomore year and normally when you start your freshman year, you wrestle against freshmen, other freshmen that are first years. And I started my sophomore year, so I wasn't wrestling against other first years. I was wrestling against people who already had a year of experience on me. So I think like part of it was like I didn't feel scrappy, but then the other part was I was just kind of outmatched in a way. Mm -hmm. And you know, like if you one year of experience over someone who has zero experience is huge. Um, so that was kind of like, you know, a problem, but I worked really hard to get better towards the end of the season. I, I felt like I was pretty good. 
but um yeah not a lot of not a lot of wins that first year <laughs> yeah um, well i want to touch on basketball real quick because i i like to watch the nba uh, i mm -hmm. never played like i just shoot around at the gym but i feel like there's a lot of similarities between basketball and counter-strike it's like five on five you take turns playing like offense and defense you have to manipulate rotation like there's set roles in basketball like you have the point guard you have the center you have like the three-point shooter so you have like these specialist roles is there yeah. like similarities that you've seen in basketball or things you were able to take away from learning basketball that you brought into counter-strike yeah i mean i think like one of the things in basketball um is that like back then when i was playing they would teach like they would teach that you know you have a specific role like you got the the center, the power forward, the, you know, like you have those roles, but at certain times, like the roles don't matter. And that's kind of the same as in CS. Like if you're on a fast break, uh, I, I don't remember what it's called, but it's like, if you're on a fast break, you want to go like down the court with two guys on the side and the ball in the middle, and then you throw the ball to the side and then that guy cuts to the middle and you go behind that guy. And like, all that to say, like, it doesn't matter if you're a center, like, you're just going to fill in that role, you know, uh, when you're in that situation. And it's the same as in CS, you know, there are a lot of times where maybe I'm the lurker, but I need an entry. Or maybe I'm the support player, but like, you need to support me or my teammate needs to support me in this round. And um, I think that's really, that's like one sim similarity, I would say. And then the other one is, um, is like, in basketball, you know, like, let's say I'm playing on the wing and someone comes towards me on the wing, I, I should move down to the corner or I should move to the opposite corner or whatever. Right. Um, and that to me is just like natural. It's like a principle, you know, like you don't want two guys in the same spot. And that's somewhat like in counter-strike, like it's about having proper spacing. spacing. Yeah. Yeah. Spacing like in a micro sense, but then also on a macro sense, like how do you shift around the map? You know, if I'm on the extreme like edge or whatever, and then my guy who's like my, uh, let's say like your B tunnels, right? You're the upper B lurk. There's a guy lower B, the guy lower B goes to cat. Well, now you can shift over to lower and you can kind of watch two things. You can watch upper B and you can watch their cat flank if they actually go up cat, you know, and it's like- you pick up an extra roll. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And and I think that's like very similar in basketball as well. You know, I didn't play at like a super high level, so I'm, I'm not like super knowledgeable, but I, those things I could feel at the time when I was playing. Yeah. It's like having court awareness, you know, yeah. it's like, yes, I, you know, we'll start off a round or a play with a set kind of design, but then we have to react on how the defense plays and we have to mm -hmm. take what we can find the spacing, right rotations. we got to fit in other spots when they don't. So it's fluid in that sense. So that's where like yeah. the game sense and the IQ of the personal player comes in. It's just, it's just not like a straight linear sequence of this, this, and this. You got to yeah. read the defense and the play and, um, you know, the shot clock, the time's running down. I got to make a play or make a move or create space or create an opportunity for my teammate. Yeah. yeah. So I feel like basketball for sure is like the most similar sport um, in terms of like, you know, Valorant or Counter-Strike. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. So you, you were a noob and you were hungry and you're competitive naturally. Um, you love to improve. That's what I've noticed about you. Once you're passionate about something, you know, I, I know you put in the work. So what work did you put in? So, you know, you said you were like third grade when you first started, like when did you actually yeah. get a computer and you're like, okay, this is it. I'm going to commit my time and shift, you know, out whatever responsibilities I have into, into getting good at gaming. I think, uh, I think I got my first computer in sixth grade, I want to say, sixth or seventh grade. I mean, before that, I was just like going to my cousin's house or going to my uncle's house. They both played Counter-Strike. And um, I would just like play on their computers whenever they let me. But yeah, my dad got me a computer in the sixth or seventh grade. And then um, that's when I started playing. And, you know, initially it was just a lot of playing. So I was playing in like pub servers, like 40 man pub servers. But then I learned about scrimming and I learned about, you know, like leagues and stuff like that. And then I started scrimming. And to be honest, like I didn't do that much mechanically to improve. I just played a lot and I worried more about like the situations I was in 
like that's kind of what i focused a lot on is like um is you know oh i'm playing this spot and this keeps happening to me like what and i always die when this happens to me what can i do differently you know and then i started learning about this website called got frag mm -hmm. which was like back like then, the hltv like back then exactly yeah yeah and i learned that i could download demos like I, I could watch pro players play so i started downloading the demos and then every time i would watch the demo i would just watch the guy playing my spot and then i would you know i would see oh he's in the same situation as me like what does he do differently what like oh he does this instead so then this happens and then i would just kind of copy that and um and then you know through that as well i learned that like pro players aren't really that good like it sounds kind of cocky to say and back then i wasn't even a pro yet but it just made me think like like literally we're playing the same game i can you know, do he this just, yeah he just yeah. does one thing differently than me and then everything else is like like fair game you know like after that is just about hitting your shot or you know uh being yeah. calm and so that's kind of what i did uh at the start of cs was i was actually like watching a lot of demos um i think before anyone even like cared to do that you know like now it's, it's like homework everyone's... for people yeah for you yeah. it was like fun it was like a learning process yeah yeah, it's just, yeah yeah and then on top of that like you know once i would get good at one spot i just wanted to keep learning new spots i'm like okay this is fucking this is easy you know like all I got to do is just download like five demos of like a certain player who's playing my spot, just see what they do. And back then as well, like because demos weren't that, um, I don't think many people studied demos, mm -hmm. like players would not change up the way they play. So it was very easy to tell, like, like a, you could watch a player play five demos in a row and they would literally do the same thing five demos in a row. So then from there, it was just like very, very easy to implement into my game because like you just have one thing that you do. And then after that, it's all about reactions and like protocols, you know? And, um, and so, yeah, that, that's kind of what I did. I learned like multiple different spots. Um, I learned like multiple different play styles and it was all from, you know, just watching demos. Yeah, I think it's an important thing you mentioned there. It's like when you're first learning, it's all about learning from your mistakes. So, mm -hmm. you know, if I die, you, you have to take a moment to think, what could I have done better? And kind of yeah. reverse engineer and backtrack that round. Was that a mechanical mistake? You know, did I, was my recoil off? Did I go too fast? Should I have been patient? Um, and that, you know, like the elite players, they reach elite status because they've had those thousands of mistakes. You know, that Jordan quote, I missed a thousand, 6,000 shots, that's why I'm great. So mm -hmm. it's that ability to learn that pattern recognition. And I'm in this situation a lot. So what is the solution I need to prepare if I'm in this similar situation next time? Then you've got it already programmed and it's kind of like, you don't have to think about it. So, and yeah, the beauty of demos is like, that's awesome about the cool thing about gaming is you can literally see first person, any player you want, learn how they think, see how they make decisions to the level that they got, different positions, um, and then you're just soaking all this information. And like you said, I don't think a lot of, enough people watch demos because mm -hmm. um, it feels like homework. You're not actually playing, but you're learning from like elite masters. You're, you're seeing them doing it in person. So um, that's cool. So once you learn about these scrims or the teams and scrimmages and like kind of organized play, um, tell me about the first team you joined. How did how did that come in and when did you start getting involved with competitive play and like actually practicing with the team? I think the first, I mean, I made like multiple teams um, and I would just like get a group of guys that, you know, were from the pub servers and I would just like invite them and like I would just ask them if they wanted to scrim with me and then we would scrim together and eventually that led to, you know, like playing in open uh, together and I was like, 13 14 at the time and i was like the wow. igl and <laughs> i tried to take the same approach that i that i took individually in uh and like apply it to a team but i don't think that worked as well <laughs> because i was a little too i didn't understand the concepts behind like 
I remember back then, Barry Games was like the best team in Source. The French I remember, team? Like, yeah, the French team mm -hmm. with Existence. And I remember I like watched them play Nuke on T side, and I was copying them, but like way too exact. Like, like I would write down the rules, one through five. Like, you know, okay, you're gonna flash this at 126, then you're gonna go here, then you're gonna do this 138 or one, you know, whatever the time was. And then I would do that for every roll, but not understand like, oh, it's just an upper exec. You know, like I wasn't, I didn't have that you're like 13 ability. Or 14. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, like I didn't have that ability to look at a macro level. So I would like tell these guys, you know, I would tell my teammates to do all this and then they would be like, what the hell? Like, what, what are we doing? And then one thing went wrong within the round and then it's like, it's over. Yeah, you know? they throw one counter flash or smoke. Someone misses a flash and that whole chain of sequence is, is off the rail. Yeah, so so that's like kind of how I started competing and I, I did that for one team and then the next team I was playing on um we so I was playing for a main team or I tried out for this main team and the trial went like really well and I was like destroying and then all of a sudden I went I go through like this slump I start playing really bad and then that team basically thought that I cheated to get onto the team hmm and so they cut me and that was probably the best thing that could have happened because right after I got cut, uh, this invite team called Fighting Irish, uh, they were a source team. They posted on like the ESCA forums asking like, oh, uh, we're looking for a fifth. Does anyone want to try out? So then I messaged Flom, who's like, uh, he's known in the CSGO community or CS2 community now. Yeah. Um, but yeah, back then he was my, he was on Fighting Irish and I messaged him to try out and gave me a tryout and then uh, eventually I got onto that team and I started playing an invite and uh and yeah the rest wow. was kind of history yeah, yeah I mean that's a huge leap going yeah. from a main team and then to, to an invite team so obviously you did something to impress them um yeah I know you know some of the people that I you know I make YouTube videos teaching people and they always talk about getting into slumps mm -hmm. what like what do you think will cause that and how did you get out of that well yeah. you know i think like back then i actually don't know like i i wasn't like you know you you always hear certain things like yeah slumps are just mental slumps are you know stop changing your settings or whatever like i i don't actually know what happened back then and what i could have done differently but now whenever I go through a slump, I always try to do the opposite of what I have been doing. So like, let's say like I'm putting in 12 hours a day, you know, and I'm all of a sudden I hit a slump. To me, I'm gonna, that's a sign to like back off a little bit. Like I need to back We're off. We're going the wrong way right now. Yeah. Obviously like, so, yeah. Yeah, like I've gotten, I've probably gotten all the benefit that I could from grinding super hard. So now I need to like deload a little bit, you know? And so that's what I'll do if, you know, if I'm going through a slump and, and I've been putting in a lot of time, but then I'll do the opposite if I haven't been putting in a lot of time. Let's say like, you know, I'm just playing the scrims and doing like an hour of DM after practice or whatever, and that's all I'm doing. Well, you know, and then I start hitting a slump. Well, maybe I should do a little bit more, you know, like maybe I should watch a few demos. And I think like, um, you know, it's about like balancing, having a good balance. Uh, that's how like I've been trying to get out of slumps if I ever get into one. Like right now I'm watching, you know, like two or three demos before practice, practicing, then I'm doing aim training later in the night and then I'm DMing. So that's like a pretty long day. And as soon as I start to feel like I'm playing worse or, or, uh, or, you know, I'm going through a slump or whatever, then I'd probably cut out like one of the things like either I'd cut out watching demos in the morning or I'd cut out the DM at night. And that's just kind of like how I've been dealing with it. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I think like, like it's just like overload. Like that, I think for me, that's why I go through slumps. Like if my mind is always thinking about CS 24 seven and I start playing bad, well, I need to like, 
get away from the game a little bit, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it takes a lot of energy and focus to even watch demos because you're just yeah. sitting there just studying and absorbing all this information. And then you add aim training in there and it, you know, it's visually taxing. You're just like shooting a thousand free throws in a row. And then you've got practice, which is even more intense in terms of like the energy and focus required. You got to communicate, you got to, you know, all this stuff. So, um, yeah. Yeah, let's talk about your current practice schedule. I mean, obviously you've got all the, all the experience, but you're still hungry. You're still putting in the time. Um, when you're watching these two or three demos, what are you looking for? Um, well, I think it, it changes like from day to day. So let's say like we're playing a map that I feel like we're not really that good on yet. Then I'm going to be looking more about like team stuff like okay generally like how is this like let's say i'm watching a team that's really good on vertigo or mirage or whatever okay how are they setting up at the start of the round on ct sides how are they playing the mid round how are they moving around the map just general things like that and then similar to to how i approach in my individual game it's like about setting the team up in those similar positions and then going through reps and reps and trying to understand the setup, you know? Um, and, you know, I could understand the setup, but that doesn't mean everyone on the team will understand the setup. So you need to give time to everyone on the team to experience different things and to come up with their own solutions um, on how to deal with it, you know? Yeah. So you'll come and to practice, like watching a demo, you'll see this really nice round and just kind of the flow of it and how they played it. Maybe on CT side, they did a certain setup and um, you come with that idea and you share it. And then do you kind of sh go an extra level of being like, if this happens, we do this and that, like, do you give them reactions or, you know, obviously you got to go through the reps so people play different play styles and different situations. They kind of learn through trial and error, but how deep do you go if you have this really great idea and what does that process look like? So the initial, the first time I bring it up, uh, or the first time I bring up like ideas or, or rounds, I go pretty in depth and it's like, I have it. I want to say I have it all figured out, but obviously there might be things that I miss, but I try to have it as figured out as I can, like A through Z. And I don't expect it to be like remembered or done properly at all. But it's just because like when we look through the rounds, there's always something to reference. You know, it's like, oh, like they did this and we talked about when they do this, like we're going to do this, you know. And also like it's really helpful for review because if, you know, I go through this, uh, if I go through something A through Z and everyone agrees, everyone like has their chance to give input. Uh, when we go through a review, we can talk about like, did we actually do what we talked about doing or did we, you know, falter or not falter, but did we, did we stray away from that? And if we strayed away, it's like, why, you know, normally if you stray away from something that you talked about is because you feel in the moment that you need to do something else. So, so if you feel like you should be doing something else, you should, you know, we should talk about why and is your feeling actually correct? Because when you're actually playing the game and like you're competing, you don't necessarily want to be thinking way too much you know you want what you thought about beforehand and what you're actually going to do to be somewhat synced up you know mm -hmm. and um and so yeah it's kind of like laying out the the blueprint and then or you know i always like using this uh this analogy of like coloring books so it's it's about like laying out the outline and then we're going to fill in the outline you know with our and that's like where the feelings come in that's where like the intuition kicks in um yeah, so having this like outline that that I bring or that Colby brings or Damien brings, uh, that's just to like enhance everyone. Yeah, yeah, I think that's very important to note that if you're bringing the practice time is limited and you only have so many mm -hmm. amount of time. So when you bring an idea to practice, you better make sure it's like prime. So yeah, it, you've got to have it locked down and be very clear. You know, it should take five ten minutes max. But you've got to have it, you know, when you go into a match, your money's on the line. Like this is this is how you prepare for it is you talk to all the details and you draw the lines exactly as you need. Um, so everyone has a very clear picture of what we're doing, what the objective is. And um, 
those kind of details matter in practice. So, um, so after talk to me about after a scrimmage, so you've done, you know, you've, you've practiced, you've got these strats you kind of want to try out. How do you learn from your scrims? What are those conversations like? Like where, cause I know feedback is very important. And like you said, understanding people's reasoning and logic is important. Is this kind of the time you do it after practice? What do, what do post scrims look like? I think, um, well, it's before in CSGO, we would actually like have a review session after practice of like 30, 40 minutes where we were like supposed to talk about everything. But in CS2, since it's uh, the games are a lot shorter, we actually have like sometimes 20 minutes uh, after the scrim to talk and we'll just spend time talking there. Um, so normally we can actually like talk about the scrim, talk about specific rounds and, and make adjustments like right after the scrim, uh, which has been pretty nice. Um, so yeah, I mean, we will we'll, like talk about the round that we tried to do and then, yeah, like I said, we'll figure out like, did we do it the way we wanted to, if we did and it didn't work, why didn't it work? And then try to adjust from there. If we just flat out didn't do it because someone felt like something else was better in the moment. Okay. What was that thing? Okay. If you're going to do that, then, you know, how do we play around that? Yeah. And that's kind of what the review session looks like. And then obviously you have to take into account, um, you know, rounds where it should have worked, but we missed the kill or we kind of skipped a step on like a micro level, you know, and those rounds are obviously like, uh, some, you know, those rounds are good too because it's about being like locked in when you're playing you know and like i've had a lot of those rounds in the past where like you know a strat should have worked but i didn't clear this corner or i like peaked before the molly bloomed and i died and like things like that and um, those things are important to talk about too because when you're in the match like you're going to remember that you know when you do this specific strat or this specific round you know mm -hmm. yeah i think it's very important to go back and talk about the rounds where you had the advantage. Like we, yeah. we had we had it here and then where did we blow it? I mean, obviously those rounds hurt the most, but those are the ones that separate champions from not, right? Like you just have to seal the deal, yeah. those high percentage plays. Um, let's shift gears. I wanna hear how you personally as an individual prepare for a match. Say it's like you go to a tournament, it's like one hour before the match, or maybe even a day before leading the match. What do you do personally to prep yourself mentally and also um, just making sure you're like mechanically sharp? Yeah, I mean, I think there are different ways that I've prepared for matches um, in the past and even now. I think like in the past, I rarely ever prepared for teams by like watching their demos. Normally in the past, like I would have experience playing against these teams. And so I would kind of already know like, oh, I'm playing against this guy. He likes to play like this. So I would already kind of have an idea going into the match um, of like the other team. And if they're aggressive they or, you know, are they pushing a lot? Yeah. Kind of tendencies. Yeah. Like that stuff. And then also I would remember like if we ever scrim them, I would remember like things that they did to me that caught me off guard. Um, so that's like, I, I didn't really prepare that much. Uh, and back then, honestly, like when I say back then, I mean, you know, before I would say 2019, 2020, I would say like, yeah. Um, I don't think people really understood macro the way that they do now. Like, I think there were probably some like, you know, good rounds where the macro was on point, but on, I don't think teams were playing that well uh, on a macro level, like consistently. Um, that's like one thing that can I'll you say. can you expand? It? Okay, I, I know you. I don't want to give away all your trade secrets, but yeah. can you just define what macro means, or give me an example? Macro to me is just like, first off, it's a lot based on utility. Like to me, utility is like king mm -hmm. in in TAC FPS. So it's about like smokes and mollies. And and um, yeah, I, I'm trying to like not 
give away a lot, but sure. that, that's there... like really important. And that kind of dictates how you play the round out. Yeah, and... I mean, cause they're expensive. They're big investments. They give you map control, certain timings. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. So, so yeah, I think um, teams weren't playing that well uh, on a macro level back then. And also I think that the level raised a lot because now you can drop nades. So you mm. can kind of, um, you can kind of like manufacture your perfect ideal scenario uh, in a way. True. So, so that's all I'll say. Okay, um, <laughs> cool. But, but yeah, I, back then I didn't really prepare that much. I, if I watched the demo, it was always more for like micro details than it was for or um, macro details. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would say that back then, my biggest, like the way that I prepared for matches the most was like always mental. Like, I think that, you know, back then the tournament started like when I got into the airport, you know, like I, my girlfriend would drop me off or my dad would drop me off at the airport and like, I'm locked in there, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's like, that was really tiring as well. Like I would tell, you know, my, my dad and my mom and, and my girlfriend, like I'm drained after a tournament. And I think that's why it's cause like, as soon as I get to the airport, I'm like locked in and, and you know, it's, um, it's not necessarily like I'm laser focused thinking about the match, but I'm just really trying hard to be just like really conscious of everything. So like, you know, I'd be waiting in a long line and I would feel myself getting like really mad. And then it's like, okay, I gotta breathe a little bit, you know, and I gotta chill out. And I feel like that's kind of what it is to play with a lot of pressure on you is like, there are going to be a lot of moments where you're really like freaking out. You're like, you're, you know, you're stressed or, you know, things aren't going your way. And it's like, you just got to be able to reset. And um, yeah, for some reason that was like really tiring for me. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, it's like you spent months and months every day practicing and now now it's time to go and it's like yeah this is do or die so you only have a few best of threes and you just have to perform in this you know two three hour slot and like everything is building up to this moment so like all the way up towards the match there's definitely like nervousness and excitement and th you know you gotta remember all your strats and like you manage all this stuff you're out of, you know outside your home traveling and stuff there's jet lag sometimes you're not getting the food you want so there's all these like external variables that affect your gameplay leading up to it yeah yeah um yeah and, and i was gonna say like all those external variables you know it's like it's like the tournaments where i felt like i played the worst were when like they would get to me like for instance like if i didn't get a lot of sleep I'd be in bed at night tossing and turning thinking like, fuck, I need to get more mm -hmm. sleep because I'm about to get two hours of sleep and I got this match tomorrow and then my mind would kind of spiral. And it's like, I would actually play bad if that happened, you know, versus the nights where, you know, I'm not getting a lot of sleep, but then I'm like, it's okay, like, whatever. Like, it, there are actually a lot of matches where I'm playing on two hours of sleep. And, um, like, I would play well. And the reason why I would play well, in my opinion, is like, I'd be, you know, laying in bed and I'd be like, okay, well, two hours is better than nothing. You know, like, let's just get, get, you know, this, this two hours of sleep and, and, you know, let's just play this match. And, you know, there are freaking surgeons that have probably done surgeries on two hours of sleep, maybe seals that are doing like life or death, you know? So I would mm. start thinking like that and I would think like, okay, I could do this, you know? Yeah. I love that. And, um, yeah. And it was like, that to me was like preparing for the match. Like, all those times where like my mind could either spiral or it could just you know it's okay like like don't worry about it we can still do it like all the that was the mental preparation i would wow. say wow yeah that's so powerful i mean that's such a mental hack um i do the same thing too it's like sometimes i'll have like negative voices or i'm stressing and i'm fearing and like all these like you know things that haven't happened yet pop up in my mind but i reprogram myself where now if like say if I'm driving in traffic, I'll I'll, th I'll always think about the positive just to get myself out of that downward spiral of negativity. It's like oh, yeah. at least I have a car, I can afford gas, like I can go anywhere I want. Or if I get bad food at a restaurant, it's like oh, at least I can afford food and I can yeah. you know choose my meals. So being able to get yourself out of negative to positive as instantly as possible, that's like the best mental reset hack 
in yeah. general, and especially when it comes to these pressure situations where you have to perform and compete. So yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny you bring up the traffic because uh, I actually would do that too. Like, like if someone was driving slow in front of me, I there were times where I would get like really mad, like, why is this guy driving so slow? Yeah. But then, you know, as soon as I started doing this, I would start thinking like, maybe it's like an old guy in front of me. Like, you know, like, let me just pass him and not really worry about it. And yeah, I think that's like when people like succumb to pressure or like when people, you know, play worse when when i guess the lights are on i feel like that that has something to do with it it might not be everything but it's definitely part of it yeah for sure like what gave me confidence was preparation so when i went to a tournament and our team had like this huge strat book and we knew exactly what we we're doing every pistol every round we've scrimmed it like it's worked we feel very confident and that alleviates the pressure, right? It's like if you're going into a big meeting or a presentation, if you know exactly what you're gonna say, you know you're gonna provide value, et cetera, you're gonna be ready and confident. So that preparation was, was huge for me as well in confidence. Yeah, so I wanna, um, just, a, just a quick question. I've seen, I know you've seen a lot of uh, demos. On a macro level, what teams do you like right now? Who, who are the ones that are just like, you know, locked in on every map that, are, that seem like they spent the time in practice preparing what teams do you like right now uh yeah this moment mm, right now honestly what i do is i just go to hltv and i look at the best teams per map so that can really change and then i'll try to watch them and just see why are they succeeding there are some teams that are succeeding because they have a lot of ways to like get a kill which is obviously one way you can win um you know a cs match and then there are a lot of teams that are kind of playing this chess game i think navi in general has always played this kind of chess game mm -hmm. uh navi is really good i think vitality is solid like they're always really solid on a macro level and on top of that they have really good ways of like just getting kills um so i would say those two teams for sure i think are reliable and then also uh, G2. G2 is also another good one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, those are some of the most experienced teams. Uh, they got great coaches as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Who do you like on an individual skill basis? Like, who are some up-and-coming players that you like and just players that you've always kind of looked in the past and always been impressed with their game? Yeah, I think it's weird because certain players I can relate to and certain players I can't. So, um, for instance, like... When I watch demos of Nico, who's super good, I watch him to learn how to like clear everything mm -hmm. because he is obviously a low sense player. His cross replacement needs to be really good. I mean, his adjustments are obviously really good as well. That's why he's been sick for forever. But um, he's like someone that I think is really like, you could just take what you see and, and if you can execute it the same way that he can execute it, it's pretty good. Um, and on top of that, I don't know this for sure about him, but I get the sense that he's a player that does not like to die. Like he does not like <laughs> He's very competitive, very passionate. Yeah. So he's like a super try hard. Yeah. So I know that if he's doing something with risk, it's probably a high percentage play. It's probably something that he's done a lot and is very successful for him. So he's, he's a player that he's aggressive when it favors him. Um, and so, so yeah, I'll watch him for those reasons. Yeah, I love um, I love those type of players that can see those winners of opportunity, and like they know this is probably not the best play, but if it pays off, it's like a round winner. So they see mm -hmm. the percentages, and like you said, like Nico, he doesn't ever force mistakes. He's not going to be one that takes, you know, the hail marys. He always plays the odds, and then, um, but he's not afraid to to go for the all ins, and you know. Yeah. 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 I mean, there are some really good players who like are the players who take 50 fifties, but they, when they take the 50 50 is not a 50 50. Like I wouldn't say Nico is like that. I would say Nico is like, you know, he's doing things that are really in his favor. And whereas like, like Stu back in the day, I think Stu was a player who like turned 50 fifties into his, 
favor mm. you know just by the way that he's doing it the little subtle like timings that he would take you know within this like really fast play and yeah i think like Stu is really good at that but yeah there are some players like that now like off the top of my head i mean obviously i've watched donk um demos donk's like insane 17 year old um, yeah. yeah already elite status almost playing at tier one yeah so yeah i mean to be honest like right now i'm watching mainly demos of people who like fall within a good system so like let's say i watch a vitality demo you know it's not necessarily that like i i want to copy you know the guy that's playing my role but i just want to see how does he fit within the system you know how is he fulfilling his role and his function within this round that they're playing or this setup that they're playing so i'll watch more for those reasons and then individually i'll try to like you know put my twist on it that's like a big thing that i've been trying to work on recently is like having my individuality because before like i would just watch like i said like players like nico or players like device or all these really good individual players and i would steal like how are they how are they like winning this fight or how are they doing this thing on an individual basis but then now i've been trying way more to like come up with it my own hmm yeah, it's like when you're watching a demo, what I like to do is imagine I'm in their shoes and yeah. feel what they're feeling mechanically, but also kind of memorize just how efficient they are, like operating the map. So it helps expand my gameplay and my feels. And then also like, oh, they're in a really shitty situation right now. This is not good. And how do they get themselves out of this jam? What, what you know, they took a left, what not, where I would have taken a right. And they have, that's that's the beauty of like individual play style is that everyone has, is so creative and artistic in their own way. Um, but I want to kind of ask you, you know, if you were to take off your humble hat, what about you in particular do you think has helped you reach the elite status? Like what makes you such a special player? Um, I think, uh, I think I've, always thought that you don't really need that great of mechanics to be really good and i think like my mechanics now are better than my mechanics back then but back then i was obviously like playing really well we were winning you know a few tournaments and placing high and stuff like that so that goes to show that that's like you know it's possible to be a really good player with um with not that great of mechanics. And I think the way I got there was like, just the the thing that I like the most is the way that I got there, you know, like by studying the game, um, just always trying to fulfill my role like the best I could. Like I would, like that's one thing that I always try to tell my teammates on every team is like, just do your role and do it really well, you know? and be like a specialist in your spot like you you should know like every single gimmick every single play you should know how to clear your angles like really well obviously you should like like if you see one thing like if you see one person at a certain spot at a certain angle you should be able to read the setup instantly oh this flash is coming i gotta turn boom kill that guy and then you know like mm -hmm. all these things and i think that that's like the kind of stuff that i focused on and then I think that the, uh, the other thing was that when I was playing really well, it was always about my baseline level. And I think that I got my baseline level like really high and the consistency. The gap, yeah. And I think the gap between like the worst CS I could play to the best CS I could play was really was like, it wasn't a huge gap. Yeah. So so yeah, and I think like within the last few years, obviously, um, it's been different because in the last few years, I've been trying to actually increase the ceiling and it's it's been tough because obviously when you try to get better, when you try to do things that you've never done before, it, like I started to question a lot of things, you know, like, like, oh, normally I would always, you know, make this decision, but I'm going to try making this decision instead and in hopes of expanding my game in hopes of raising the ceiling you know 
oh, I never relied on aim throughout my whole career. Well, let me actually try to get better at aiming and see what I can do. And then like, you know, I might have better dexterity in my hands and my wrists now, but to apply it in CS in a way that actually can get you results is a whole nother thing, you know, because aim can, or mechanics can be a double edged sword. You think that you're super good and you can out aim anyone. So you start taking all these fights, but your gauge for if the fight is bad or not is off because, you know, you're affected by the fact that you think you have better aim. So all these things, you know, play, play a factor when you're trying to increase your ceiling. And that's not something that I ever focused on before, but it's something that I'm trying to focus on now. And so the gap is bigger, but you know, yeah. I know how to raise the floor and I never raised the ceiling. And now I'm trying to, you know, do both. Uh, yeah, that's, that's awesome. What you said, I think some people get into a pattern of just doing what they know works and they never allow themselves to try new things and expand their gameplay. So there's this element of uncertainty or being looking like a beginner or being afraid to make mistakes. So they just do the same thing every time, but it's not going to work for every team. You've, you've got to expand that gameplay and just like have all the cards in the deck. And you got to be able to know when you see a certain deck flash that the other player has, you got to know how to react instantly. So, um, yeah, another great point about like, so, you know, I've gotten into that trap where my aim is so good. So I'm just going to take all these fights and then I throw away huge advantages. I overextend, over peak. I didn't wait for my teammates. So there's always this balance of like aim versus IQ and knowing, you know, when to take the fights, when not to. Um, yeah, those are great points. So I want to, you've played with some phenomenal players um, throughout your time. I know Valens was a huge impact on your career. Um, talk me through what your relationship early on with Valens was and how he helped you personally kind of, yeah, get better at your game. I think, um, you know, Valens or, uh, or Soham, he, he helped me a lot with out of game stuff. You know, like, I think that there are a lot of players um, that play CS that have the ability to play um to play at a tier one level uh but i don't think there are a lot of players who can play on a tier one team and okay. that strictly is because it's not all about in-game stuff it's about the out of game stuff it's about how do you how can you work with a group of four other or five other guys how can you convey your ideas and your frustrations and your opinions to them in a way where it actually feels like you know you're all on the same uh path or the same journey like like i think those are the things that that uh that really make good tier one players um and so i think that that's where he helped me a lot in the past was like you know i have a frustration i talked to him about it and he would kind of show me the way when it came to like how do you navigate this within your team you know because there's you know in-game iq there's uh there's like having good mechanics having good skill right but then there's also this like emotional iq that you need to be on a team um and i think that that's like kind of what he helped me with a lot um and you know i'm not perfect but i think that with everything he's taught me uh throughout the years i'm really able to just get better at it like day by day you know yeah yeah i mean that's it's a team game at the end of the day and you have five personalities five egos five people that agree disagree and to keep the team morale up you've got to be able to say tough things sometimes and you got to point out mistakes and those are tough you know no one likes to hear okay you messed up that round but the way you deliver that and the pitch and the timing is going to be the factors if they accept that information and kind of process it because some people yeah. especially younger kids they can get defensive and um you know if, if that keeps building that kind of conflict and you're just not treating each other with like respect um it's just it's never going to work out who are some of the players that you worked 
uh, uh, played with that had high emotional IQ? Like who who are your teammates that you that were the kind of the glue of the team that 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 you liked hanging outside of the team that brought that kind of X factor of good morale? I think um, the obvious one for me is like is Tarek. He is uh, he's someone where like you know. He's just someone that like did a lot for the team in in terms of this like you know if he ever said anything to you or if he ever got mad at you it was like it was justified he would say it in a good way and he was very stern like like this can't be happening anymore you know and there was no like passive aggressiveness there was no like talking behind people's backs um there was none of that and and he was also he would also hold himself very accountable you know like if he ever did anything that was like uh that was wrong or that was um a little out of pocket then he would he would call himself out for it like very fast and so i think he's probably the best when it comes to this that i've played with um yeah, mainly yeah. mainly him. Yeah, I've watched some of his streams, and he just seems like a very chill, happy, high energy type of guy. Something you just want to hang out in person. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's always a good trait. Uh, out of all your teammates, who was the most mechanically gifted? I played with so many mechanically gifted players, so it's it's really tough. Yeah. I think like there there are two different types of like mechanically gifted player i would say uh ska he was gifted mechanically but when it came to like learning game mechanics so like for instance like in cs or csgo you know you could bunny hop you could like squeeze uh a little bit of distance if you like could long jump um you know there were like all these jumps that like for instance i don't know if you remember like cobble you could jump on the plat from uh I think we called it Olaf, or I forget, but you could jump on, on tree, actually. That's what it was called. You can jump on tree if you could hit this, like, really weird jump. And he could hit all those jumps. He, like, mastered, like, in-game mechanics, you know? And he's good at that for every game. It doesn't matter what game he plays. He'll learn those, those like, weird mechanics or whatever. And then there are players that are gifted mechanically when it comes to, like, quote-unquote, raw aim, you know? like just mouse and keyboard it's like they're not doing anything crazy in the game they don't they're not like abusing game mechanics they just have like very good like hand eye coordination and like reflexes i think when it comes to that uh it's really tough to say breeze who i'm playing with right now is probably one of those guys he's like very good at that um i think saya player who i played with uh on T1 Valorant was also like some of the cleanest mechanics I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. So, so I think those two uh, had very good mechanics. Yeah, um, I mean Breezy, he he was multiple time top twenty player. You know, he yeah. had a streak where he was just insane. He was like one of the best players in the world. And when you see someone like that, they just make the game look so easy. There's no wasted movement. Crosser's always the right place. You're moving out at the right time, and it's just so fun to watch. Um, yeah, so let's, uh, let's see, you've been playing professionally now, how long? Eight, nine years? Uh, at, at... uh pretty long time. Uh, almost 10 years. Yeah. 10 years. Do you, are there any differences between, I mean, you're not old, but you're, I mean, what's awesome is that you're <laughs> still, you're still getting better. Like you said, you've never felt better with your aim. How, what differences are there? Do you, do you feel any like difference in, in your gameplay between now and then? Um, do you feel like you're still in your prime? Well, yeah. I think like, I think for one, um, I think there's room for me to be better than ever. And it's kind of up for me, up to me to be able to like show that. Obviously, you know, I say that and there are gonna be a lot of people saying like, that's cope or whatever. 
and uh i just don't i mean that, that's fine but it's just kind of the route that i took um i have a lot of confidence that that statement's true you know what i mean because you know it's kind of like before i became pro in cs and before i had my quote unquote prime earlier in my career like how did i get there you know it's like no one saw the years and years of like being bad no one saw the years and years where like i was like i just looked like an idiot you know when i was playing and so that's how i got to like my my prime you know was having all that and so when i talk about like trying to increase my ceiling and like people see me play now and it's you know i still think i'm pretty good now but um is not what it was they think like that is just because it's just a decline you know but it's like it's like that decline has a purpose you know what i mean it's and if there was no purpose behind it if i didn't know why i was doing playing worse or if i didn't um if i wasn't putting in work elsewhere to get better then yeah then i would say you know yeah, i'm probably done but i think it's like almost on purpose to like that i'm playing a little bit worse now in hopes that i can play a lot better in the future sure and um i mean it's yeah. part of the process and i i know you took a, a couple of years and you switched to valorant Mm -hmm. um so obviously there's a transition there i mean you, you know it's a whole different it's a different game um topic through your experiences through valorant um what kind of the diff what you enjoyed about valorant and then kind of the differences between the two games of, of counter-strike and valorant yeah i think what i enjoyed about valorant was like i enjoyed the fact that you could become a specialist at like your agent like you could play Cypher and just know like all the setups, all the, like everything, you know? And you just had one role and it was really defined and you just played that role and that character and you could like deep dive on them on every, or on the maps that you played that character, obviously. Was that the and agent you, what, what agents did you specialize no. in? So at first I played Omen. Yeah. And I didn't really like playing Omen. How come? It just, it didn't really fit me because or okay, it depends on how the team uses your agent. I'll say that because there were some teams where I saw how they were using Omen, and I was like, I really like this. You know, like, like I remember Sub Rosa. He would play Omen, and uh, he was like very aggressive with him, doing like very aggressive TPs, going for aggressive lurks, and that's how TSM used their Omen. And on T1, that's not how we used them. On T1, he was like um he was always playing like weak side and what i mean by weak side is like he's alone on on t sides on the extremity but he can't go for anything right because you're by yourself wait there yeah and he needs to wait there he needs to hold for a push he needs to be alive so he can throw smokes he needs to then regroup with the team so then he can throw the omen flash for the jet to dash and that was kind of how he used omen and which is not my style uh it's not doesn't fit me like you wanted to be I more think, aggressive and make plays and yeah take initiative. i wanted to have yeah exactly i wanted to have some agency on my side of the map um so so that didn't fit me and then we like played around with it i played a bit of like killjoy and cypher and and it was tough because i didn't have a lot of time to learn uh those agents and um so i wasn't good at them i wasn't really that good with them at the start so then I started playing Duelist, started playing Rays and Jet, and that's where I kind of mm. found my my stride. Um, you know, with Rays, I got her instantly. Like, I got her kit instantly. Like, I thought she was so OP back then. Uh, you have a Roomba that's really good for info, but also like gives you an instant advantage when you're taking a fight, which is, which is like no Duelist has that, um, where they can get info. They can clear uh, an entire angle or off angle yeah. or yeah so that was really Free good bait. and then yeah and then the nade was like obviously nades are really good but back then i don't think like raises were using their nade properly like like 
they would use nades to you know get kills or to clear out a spot but the way that i use the nade was like to take additional info and like keep the info so like for instance split if they're coming up mail obviously you would nade them push them back into mail but then what i would do differently is like nade them push them back into mail but then smoke the bottom of mail and like take that space back and keep the space for an additional 15 seconds if they wanted to come back and hit b my killjoy had a setup still on b and we were like good and during this time i'm forcing them to a because i smoked bottom mail so either they're in there and i kill them or they have to leave and their instant reaction is okay let's go up ropes and go a but then my teammate is is already rotating third to a so you know it's all these little things that i could do on like different maps that would just help put the team at the right spot at the right time you know all based off like two pieces of util mm -hmm. um so anyways i i felt like i understood her kit pretty well and how to use it on a macro level um and then i started playing jet and the reason why i have this like confidence that you know my my best is yet to come is basically from when i was playing jet and when i was playing jet i was horrible with her i thought like oh i have to be like so aggressive i have to like always dash in i always have to you know i always have to be making space and so i overdid it and you know i was trying to find that limit of of how much space can i create how much how aggressive can i actually be and so like our team would track our scrims and our uh, kds and i had a negative kd for like the first month of playing jet and i was horrible and i'm sure my coach was like second guessing you know should we really put tim on jet but but i was playing horrible then all of a sudden you know we start playing matches and the decisions that you know it just started to click for me like started to click like okay i in this situation i was like going really aggressive and i didn't get away with it you know i died so i'm gonna chill here and obviously i would do this in practice leading up it's not like it just changed 180 in the match but but i was more calibrated you know my levels of aggressivity were were more polished mm -hmm. and um yeah those are uh just a it's a question on that because i mean that's a huge change in play styles between all those agents yeah. uh, obviously in jet you need kind of a higher sense you have more verticality did you change your settings and sensitivity and like your posture your arm position all that stuff or were you able to kind of keep those the same sense throughout all those agents how did you adjust mechanically around those different roles yeah so the change in sense already had happened like in cs when i started opping so like when when i worked with you for instance i was um i was opping on c9 and i was playing somewhat low sense and then as i got onto different teams i was like struggling with the low sense uh because i felt like i couldn't really track people as well and like i don't know it just with the low sense it's harder to get on target in a smooth manner in my opinion uh as fast as i needed to do it with the op so i would i would resort to like almost like reflex flicking you know and like throwing my mouse and like trying to flick you had less time and less speed yeah so that just resulted in a lot of whiff shots if my like if my throw wasn't accurate so then i lowered my sense so that i could get on target faster but while aiming you know yeah uh, and you, mean was, you lowered your sense even more or you raised it i raised it even uh -huh, more uh -huh. because i wanted to move my mouse fast enough to get on target but while actually aiming whereas if i'm on low sense and i tried to take the same approach i would be too slow um and the speed that i had to move my arm would not match the i guess speed that i needed to get on target yeah so you you knew you needed to raise your sense uh, and it was going to help your gameplay but obviously that's going to throw off like your muscle memory and all that you know feelings yeah. you've built what is that process of fine-tuning your sense how did you know what when to stop you know you raised it enough like how, what, what does that look like what is that in game how do you do that um well i don't like okay i didn't think that i needed to raise it much i was playing 1.8 400 when i was playing for you on c9 um before that i had played 1.4 400 so huge, That's a difference. huge difference yeah 
huge difference already and but you know 1.8 or whatever was like within my wheelhouse like i had played that since before in uh throughout my career so it wasn't too bad but i still felt like it was a little too slow so i changed it to 2.4 on when i played on gen g and i was horrible I was absolutely horrible. I had no trust in my aim. You know, the purpose of of raising my sense, like I said, was because I wanted to get on target faster, but I actually took more time to get on target because I couldn't aim with it. I had no control. So, so I was really, really bad, and I did a lot of different things. Um, first was I focused on tracking. I focused on just being really like smooth with my tracking um and not over over reacting you know like when when you're tracking a bot and it changes direction and you're on a sense that you're not used to you over flick the, the correction it's like a, a catch lot. up yeah yeah so you're catching up so yeah yeah so so i had to like retrain all that and um so i did a lot of tracking a lot of dm obviously a lot of moving my mouse slow like i remember kusta he actually showed me something that i liked a lot which was he would go on aim bots and he would just move his mouse really slow to the target, but in a really straight line, and just like shoot instantly when when he was it's on 100%. the target. Yeah, yeah. So, so he showed me that, and like I started moving my my mouse slow, and my mouse is like going up and down, up and down because it was just not used to the sense. And then eventually, I found out, you know, you gotta be able to move it slow in order to move it fast, and um, and that's kind of. I guess the approach that I took, um, and yeah, I mean, there's no real secret. It was just, you know, I did a lot of aim training to get used to it. I DM'd a lot and, um, and yeah, it just took time, you know, and I was horrible with it, like, like absolutely horrible, but I stuck with it. Um, and then it paid off because on T1, I'm playing Valorant. Obviously there are things moving, flying across my screen. And I was playing higher sense and and I was used to it because of what I did in, in CS. Awesome. Yeah, I know that's like the holy grail of gamers is to find that perfect sense. But I think beyond the number, you've got to learn the, the anatomy of it, of how to put your elbow and your arm, how high or low your elbow is, like the angle, like your posture, all these things affect obviously how you move the mouse and it's all connected. So it's like you do have to go through the reps of experimenting with different senses and figuring out and like kind of reverse engineering your misses. It's like, oh, I'm obviously over flicking or my crosshair is too shaky. And, you know, you have this personal feel, and this hand eye coordination and athleticism that everyone has to be able to, like I said, reverse engineer your misses and fine tune that, num fine -tune that number down to like a 0 0.01, 0 0.02. Yeah and um there's no shortcuts you, you got to put in the time yeah. so yeah yeah there's a lot of stuff like that actually that i looked at like when i first started opping on c9 i looked at ska and i looked at his setup looked at his mouse grip looked at like everything like and what i found was that he uses his wrist a lot and his fingers a lot that's like if you could i mean he basically claws his mouse like this if you can see and wow. he moves it like this so his palms not right? even touching no and yeah. he moves his he moves his, his mouse like that a lot and when he's swiping he's swiping only okay i mean his forearm moves a little bit yeah. but it's mainly his wrist swiping and he plays low sense so i tried or low lower than you would think you I think he played like 1.6 uh cents for for a while which is really slow for an opera and then on top of that like a lower zoom sense and he used like 1.8 or something towards the end of his career but that, that's not too low but um but yeah that's what i realized and i was trying to do that you know i tried to use 1.6 use my wrist and fingers only and it felt impossible mm -hmm. and i'm thinking like why is it impossible and then like i look at his hands and his hands are massive yeah and i'm thinking he's a tall guy yeah i mean this is where like i mean i don't know if i'm overthinking it too much but i'm just taking you through my thought process at that time I thought, okay, he has longer fingers, so he has more range of motion. He so does. Because he has more range of motion, and he, he can use a lower sense because he has, he can move his mouse more with his longer fingers. Whereas if me, I have smaller hands, smaller fingers, my range of motion on 1.6 is way less if I'm just using my fingers. So I need to 
readjust. So then I went to 1.8, 1.9, around there, and I could do kind of the same movements that he was doing with just my uh, my hands, or just my wrists and my, my fingers. Yeah. So I actually did that. And on top of that, when he sits, he sits like angled mm -hmm. like this, and his whole elbow is on the, or actually not his whole elbow, his um, most his forearm. Yeah, like three three fourths of his forearm is on the table, and it's nice because when you have your whole like forearm on the table for the most part, it's locked. And and the nice thing about being locked is, like, <coughs> okay, the bad thing is less range of motion, obviously, but the good thing is that it's very stable. So that's why I think he did it is because he's very stable. He's just using just his wrists and his fingers, and I don't know. I don't know if you ever thought about that. But all the time when i'm like yeah, <laughs> yeah well i don't know if scott thought about that when when he was you know deciding to sit like that and play like that i think maybe it was just natural but when i looked at him that's what i thought about and that's what i saw yeah i mean the thing with the grip where you, the palm isn't touching the hand there's not many pros that do that i know hiko yeah. does that and it's like your only touch with the mouse is your fingertips so some people have extremely good dexterity and feel in their fingers, but it's also less stable. But you do yeah. get the advantage of these like micro flicks, and, and it kind of makes sense with an op because you you need that. You need that verticality. This is the fingers is much faster than shifting the arm. So yeah, exactly. when his crosshair is placed, he only has to aim at this much amount of area, and his fingers can reach that area. He's good. So yeah, that, that makes sense. Yeah, exactly. Like I struggled with up and down flicks because just like. I don't know if you can see my arm on the webcam, but like mm -hmm. going like that is like, it's very slow, very tiring. And like, it's slow. The movement is slow, but then also my reaction time to do that is slow. Mm -hmm. Hey, <laughs> Sorry, Gabby. My girlfriend just, <laughs> Ron says hi. Yeah, I'm I know we're going, go we're run about running out of time here. Oh, no, you're, uh, you're you, good. You guys got a date or something. Okay. <laughs> no, no, not yet. Okay. But, um, but anyways, yeah, I struggled with those vertical flicks. So I would... Like, if I knew that I had to flick up, I don't know if you can see, mm -hmm. but I would purposely, or sorry, if I knew that I had to flick, yeah, up, I would purposely, like, curl my fingers in so that I could go up. And if I knew that I had to uh, flick down, I would do the opposite. Wow. So you're meaning, like, in a specific situation, you would change your grip a little bit to create that space with your fingers? Yeah, exactly. Whoa. Like, like a, a really, like, one that I did for sure was when I was, when I would op IV on train, like on IV on train, they could peek jump on top boost. of the trash can or yeah, they could jump boost as well, but they could peek top of the trash can or below the trash can. So if they, if I'm aiming for below the trash can, then my fingers are ready to go up, hmm. right? Like up if they peek uh, on the trash can or if they're run boosting across, I'm even ready to go like up to the right. And um, so I know I did that. Like if I'm holding uh t mid on train and i'm worried about them peeking on top of the pallet same thing so there were a lot of like these angles that i would hold regularly that i would like be very conscious of how my hands were on the mouse that's interesting um, i've never heard yeah. of that before that makes sense yeah i mean it's just because it wasn't natural to me right like it's something that like ska when he did it he probably just like did it instinctively but if i did it instinctively i would have just sucked forever you know so yeah. so i had to kind of learn a different way to do it cool um just a few more questions here um who was the smartest player you ever played with who was the craftiest who just pulled rabbits out of the hat out of nowhere and just did all this crafty you know yeah out of box plays smartest player okay i think there are like three that come to mind i think Stu and flusha were the smartest intuitively like i think Stu understood kind of what was happening all across the map and what was happening and same with flusha uh, i think they both understood what was happening across the map and i think that they they were very aware of what the other team was trying to do they weren't just focused on their game they were focused on what the other guy was doing and you know like i remember it's really funny. I was playing uh, Connect Four with Flusha. Uh, we were at I Am Dallas. I think you were our coach at the time as well. But we were, um, we, yeah, we were playing Connect Four, and like I was losing to him, and he told me like, 
okay, you're thinking way too much about what you're doing and you're not looking at what I'm doing. And I was like, oh shit, like, have I been playing CS <laughs> that way this whole time? You know, like, like, um, so that kind of opened my eyes. But yeah, I think that they thought a lot about that and that that's what made them very smart. Is like, mm -hmm. it wasn't about them. And you know, even to this day, you hear a lot of players saying like, oh, we're just gonna play our own game or I'm just gonna play my game. And to an extent, you do need to play your own game. But I think that, you know, you should take into consideration what the other team is trying to do, you know? And um, obviously when people say they're playing their own game, it's more like, how do you start the round? Like, oh, we're just gonna play our own game. And then they get the reads later in the round, like, oh, they're trying to bid B split, let's do this or whatever. Um, so I think it does come into play, but I think that they were like really good at it before people even realized, you know? Mm -hmm. They had really um, good prediction skills. They could read the round, kind of yeah. see where the round is flowing, where I need to rotate, where the gaps are. Yeah. And I think that it was just like feeling based. Like for me, I never had that feeling. Now I think I I can read the round the same as them, but it's more of like a learned skill. You know, it's like, oh, I didn't know that you were thinking like that. Like, let me try to understand how I could come to the same conclusion that it might take me a little bit longer, but, you know, I still want to be able to come to that same conclusion. And, you know, I mean, you worked with Flusha. If you ask him, like, why he would make a decision, he would just tell you, like, I just felt it. You know, like, right. like he was he was that kind of guy. Um, yeah. So, the, yeah, so, yeah, I mean, like, there's always, like, looking back in the tournaments I played, that gut and feeling where it's just overwhelming. It's like, you instinctively know something's gonna happen or i just know i have to be at b they're gonna hit b and it's like uh, it's hard to explain but you're like internalizing all this information you're reading the rounds the history all the demos you've watched all your experience culminates to this gut feeling that is telling you something and i always tell people go with it because if you if you don't go with your gut like now you're second guessing yourself you're not you're not playing your own game so yeah, I always yeah. tell people, you go with your gut, and then if you make a mistake, whatever. It's like, man, dude, I felt it. This is, you know, the decision I had to make. And then you, you talk about it after, but that gut is where all those windows of opportunities happen. This is how you win, you know, you win losing rounds, or you, you, you flank when you know you're not supposed to technically, but you just know that you have to. And, you know, there's there's no metric around that, but it's like that's what great players do. They just have this insane feeling and gut, be able to come to that final decision, and then be able to actually execute and do it and like you know go through with it. And yeah, Flusha was just insane. I remember there was this round. It was a huge round zone on Inferno. It was like a one on two or something, and he he went through janitor and he like hard cleared this right corner stairs, yeah, and then yeah. he killed the guy Pit. I think we talked about yeah but it's like dude who hard clears that and the way it the way he did it, he like took full five seconds to do it and he did it perfectly and he killed it god i was like holy shit you're a genius and he ends <laughs> up winning the round it's just like little things like that that like no one else would take time to do they would just kind of skip it and rush through yeah so, yeah yeah he was that type of guy and him, him and Stu are both pretty good in that regard um the other guy that i think is like one of the smartest guys i ever played with is dazed and I think Dazed was smart in the opposite way. You know, like obviously he has a good, he has good intuition for the game and he has good feeling, stuff like that. Um, but he is way more like, he can explain to you A through Z why he's feeling this and why, like how he came to this conclusion or why he made this decision. And I'm not saying that like, Again, like Flusha and Stu could probably explain some things to me as well, like in terms of why they made these decisions. And it is more about like what side of the spectrum are they on? You know what I mean? And Days is way more on the logical side. Yeah. And whereas uh, Stu and Flusha, I feel like are more on the feeling base side. Mm -hmm. So, but anyways, yeah. So Days, he can like tell me exactly how to like why he made his decision, why he made a specific call, how to manipulate the other team so that his decision will become right. And he could tell me everything. And um, 
and yeah, he was like someone that was very smart at not only like like explaining the game, but also like teaching it to other people in a way that's like very relatable. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. The the being able to explain complicated situations and all the X, Ys, and Zs and the dots and the Ts. That's where I feel those are the players you learn from the most. Because you really understand the principle and the concept and the structure of the thought process. For some people, yeah, it's based on feel. And being able to explain that has been, is a valuable asset. And I believe Dazed was an IGL at one point, or is that? Yeah, he, he was IGL. Yeah. Would you say he was like one of the best strategists you played with? Like who was a captain or a, an IGL that you played for that just came up with genius strats and ha had like perfect game plans? So funnily enough, I think that Daze was really good at CT sides. He was really good at like, um, yeah, structuring a CT side. I mean, he was known for his CT sides in CS, but when I played with him in Valorant, I also think that he was really good in, uh, on CT sides. And Stu and Flusha, in my opinion, were way better on T sides. Hmm. Uh, like, I'm... I haven't really thought about why that is, but I just think that on T sides, maybe there are more timings that you can take and more like reading that you can do based off what the CTs are showing you. Um, which, yeah, I guess gave them more opportunities to let their kind of intuition shine, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, so, who, yeah. I, I feel like T sides are easier to prep than CT sides. What do you think? You mean, do you mean like watching, prepping for another team's T side or prepping for another team's? I think it's easier like for our te my team to develop a T side than a CT side. The CT side kind of feels like it gets more into the nuances and, the, and, and it's more punishing um, in general. Like it's, it feels like more work for me than a T side because... On T side, you kind of dictate the map a little bit more than on CT side. CT side's more reactionary. What What are your yeah. thoughts on that? For me, it's opposite. I like, like, on our team right now, I control a lot of the CT sides, and I'm, like, helping a lot. And I just think that, in general, I've been a very, like, reactive player. Um, there's, like, there's this meta of like being very proactive on CT sides, like kind of taking the fight to them, taking control and and that was like defined as proactive. Um, I still think it's somewhat reactive because like you go into a setup, right? And like you're waiting for them to do something, they don't do something, okay, you're gonna clear the spot anyways. And so it's reactive, but also proactive at the same time. I, I don't know. I just yeah, think that like, yeah, like, and um, I don't know, I, for me, I just feel like it's a lot easier to set those protocols, to set those things, because at a certain point, it's like like you determine what you're willing to fight for and what you're willing to give, you know? And then depending on that decision that you make, the weak side, quote unquote, needs to adapt. So an easy example is like, okay, Mirage, we're gonna rotate to 3B. So we're rotating to 3B. Well, the A guy can't fucking hold A, you know, unless he's in ramp. If he's in ramp, then maybe he can take like the 1B1 or whatever, but but automatically that kind of dictates, okay, I'm gonna go play retake A now. The jungle guy's like, okay, well, he, if he's gonna play retake A, then maybe I'll play back on A. You know, that's like one option. The other option is, okay, let's go double ramp, you know, like, we're gonna give up the middle part of the map. We're just gonna play for ramp control because there's 3P and and so things like that, you know. Um, it's like one one side of the map makes a decision, and then the other side of the map needs to make the corresponding decisions, you know. Right. And without giving too like, much space. Yeah, and like that's obviously one way to do it. The other way you can do it is like someone can just call the setup, like, oh, let's go into this. And that's also another way, but, um, yeah, but yeah. Okay. Um, so we'll wrap this up. I want to ask a selfish question. Um, okay. 
we worked together for about six, seven months. Uh, we lived in California, played in Cloud9. What are some of the things, if any, <laughs> that you felt like I was brought value? Like, was there anything I did that um, you appreciated that I did or like some, you know, if I helped? And then on the flip side, what could I have got better at as a coach? I think, uh, well, for one, you were very organized. And I think you were somewhat ahead of your time um, because back then, like coaching was not really like, like I think esports was so young back then, specifically like CS, I don't know about other games, but CS, I felt like was so, was still young back then. And like the players didn't really buy into, you know, like structuring practice, having like an agenda, having um, deliberate goals. Uh, whereas I think like nowadays, like the players are way more willing to kind of like be hands off when it comes to that and just like play and 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 do those things um or sorry do what the coach kind of tells them to do i think players are more willing to do that now uh but yeah i think that's like one thing that you were really good at um and then in terms of like oh sorry one more thing i remember i don't know if you remember this but i <laughs> I remember we were playing a match at E-League and we were on overpass and you took a timeout and I forget the call exactly, but you took the timeout and you go, yo, this round, you guys need to do this. Like, trust me. And then we did it and then it worked. And I was like, damn, I've never had a coach really like <laughs> make that assertive of a it call. Was, it was know? a playground take that we practice. Like, we're like, we need yeah, the yeah. strat. And yeah, I was like, dude, we need, we're giving them too much space. Like it's over, it was overtime. It was like yeah. one of the rounds. And then I was like, we just need to take the fight to them try to get guys pumped up and yeah. you guys executed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you called that and I was like, damn, like you called that with conviction <laughs> and I, I like that. Awesome. But um, yeah, and then in terms of what you could work on was, like I said, I don't necessarily know, like it, I think maybe like finding a middle ground of like, how can we be organized and deliberate with practice with, you know, people that or you know kids that aren't really down for that like how can you kind of sneakily do it you know it's like it's like feeding your dog you know, like putting medicine in a uh, in peanut butter for your dog <laughs> you know like that kind of thing right i felt like yeah maybe you could have like found a way to do that but then again like i think was that your second team or first team uh technically my third team i coached uh team mvp in korea which okay, I okay. don't really count because my English wasn't as good. And then uh, I coached complexity for a year and then, then you guys. Yeah, I see. Yeah, I think like probably in, in Korea it was probably very different. I I think their culture is way more like like listen to the coach, listen to like the guy in charge. Yeah, whereas in, yeah, whereas in NA, I think that's like a struggle to... to it's like homework. Of, yeah. Kind of, yeah. Yeah, so... So yeah, I guess finding in terms of improve or improvement for you was like finding a way to to yeah, make the homework fun. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But that was back then. Nowadays I think like people know like like this is serious, you know, like we're not just like a group of friends hanging out playing a game. We're like this is like business, this is work, you know. Yeah. Those things can be fun as well, but it's you know business comes first yeah i mean it's it's all about preparation for me you know and mm -hmm. how you use that time and it's only limited so yeah if you have like four or five months of straight practice before a tournament i mean you you'll your strapbook is filled and and fine-tuned but if you have one two months it's like dude you, you have to be on point with that practice time and be intentional yeah. of what we're working on what gaps oh, yeah. do we need to fill in terms of strategy um you know how do we master our defaults you know, pistol rounds are huge. anti goes like you have to have every single round for every situation, at least one go to that you can rely upon. So when it's tournament time, like it alleviates the pressure because everyone knows, OK, dude, we have playground take. We've executed. We practice it. We're confident in it. And it takes the thinking out. And just um, when you get to that point where you just execute because you've gone through the trial and error, it brings confidence. So 
I know a topic that you've studied and learned and you've definitely hit is, is flow state. Um, you know, that perfect mental level where everything is effortless, all your decisions are flowing, you just feel unstoppable. What does that feel like for you? Like, when's the last time you hit it? And what are your thoughts about flow state? Last time I hit flow, I mean, I don't even really remember the last time I hit flow state, honestly. Um, I mean, I think like the thing about flow state is that it just comes and goes as it pleases. And um, I think like my worst performances and the worst CS I've played is like when I'm chasing that too much. Uh, because, you know, for me, flow state is kind of, you're not thinking at all. Like you're just, your body and your mind, like, like it's just one and you're just doing whatever feels right. And there's no second thought. There's no inner dialogue whatsoever. And, and that's definitely happened, uh, throughout my career. Um, but it's just hard to replicate and I don't really. I haven't found a successful way of replicating it every time. And I don't think it's really that possible to replicate it every time. Um, but what I do think is you can replicate is like getting into the zone. Getting into the zone and like flow state to me are two different things. Uh, getting into the zone is kind of when, you know, you're, you're not missing a beat really and there's still that inner dialogue happening but it's just super in tune and in sync with with what your body is doing you know and what what um yeah i mean so that, there's still a mental it. thought but it's working harmoniously it's not getting in the way oh, it's yeah. supporting yeah. you exactly and there are a lot of times where like you know in in cs it's hard to say it's hard to put it into words, but I feel like when I'm playing my be best CS is when I'm not missing a beat. And when I have like this presence of mind to do like every little small thing right. And every second, it's every even half yeah. second, it's just an yeah, steady. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, like every, like every pixel I'm aiming at, how I'm clearing every angle, how I'm timing my peaks, how I'm like all this stuff, right? That's like all on point. And when I'm, doing that it's normally my like i'm actually thinking about doing every single thing you know it's like when i'm peeking in like an angle i'm clearing the off 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 angle first and then i'm clearing the off off angle and then the off angle and then the actual angle it's like i'm thinking about that i'm not just doing that willy-nilly you know what i mean like i'm you're actually not going thinking. through the motions you're really yeah. present and executing it live in the moment yeah and you know you could call it what you want um but for me I think that that's like being in the zone and and uh i think that when i was playing very consistent cs very uh stable cs that was when i was able to do that every single time and i practiced that like that's the cool thing about like just trying to get into the zone is like you can actually practice that every single day you know it's just playing consciously playing deliberately like being mindful i think you could you like anyone can do that yeah. And so I remember like I had this problem on C9 where where I was playing really well some days and really bad other days. And I had like really high highs, really low lows, and I just tried to like like limit that range like we talked about earlier. And um and the way I did that was just bringing like a consistent effort, a consistent emotional level and like consistent decision making. You know, like every decision I made was like a decision that I've made hundreds and hundreds of times. It's a decision I thought about, like, would I do this with, you know, major on the line or whatever, with like tournament on the line? Would I make this decision? Would I make this peak? And I tried to really think about that, you know, and it's not like I'm only going for, for, plays that are like way in my favor like that you you can't win a tournament only you know with the hail mary throws yeah but um you know i i just tried to think a lot about that 
and and then when it came time to actually play the game i i was just doing what i've yeah. done every single day and that gave me the potential to kind of sometimes hit that flow state that you're talking about yeah you know? that reminds me of i saw an interview with like kobe i think and just you know his insane work ethic and how he preps for games and like you know he's infamous for for being three or four hours early but they were watching him practice and he was practicing like full gameplay moves with like full intensity in those practice sessions when no one was there like 100 percent effort you know like pivot like stop like exactly how we would in a real game and when you're that intentional and during practice it translates naturally when you actually play so that practice time it's like some people it's like oh it's practice i'm not going to go 100 percent or i'm not going to play like i normally do but you have to have that mindset of like like this practice is do or die this is the finals and that locked in like 100 percent try our mode when you when you do that during practice again it becomes natural when you play it live in matches so um that is like even your practices are are better than other people's practices because you have that intentionality and that that the level of execution and focus so um it also helps you access that zone right like yeah, I'm going to be in the zone during practice all the time, no matter what. And I know what it takes to be there. And I'm like doing this when I don't have to, but it's just like that level of intensity. Like when you're peeking every corner, you're locked in and you're doing it perfectly. So again, when it's matches is natural. I remember when I was playing CS2, it was like, I was overthinking peeking these angles. I'm like dissecting these rounds mentally, like mechanically. It's like, oh, I know I got to peak this much and this much. But then I'm like getting in my way. I'm not like locked in being reactionary, like being ready to click. So it's just like this threshold between trying too hard and getting in your own way compared to, you know, opening that flow where it's like effortless, but you're still conscious and you're in your in your intense with your actions. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've been I've been climbing recently, like doing rock climbing and I've um I have like a coach that has been, you know, helping me get better at climbing. One of the things he said is, you know, he's watching me and he's like seeing that I'm a little hesitant and he just tells me, you know, come up with a plan and execute it. And like, that's it. Like, that's all you gotta do. And then like learn from there. And I think like, you know, what we're talking about when it comes to like, um, you know, getting into the zone and opening up the opportunity for flow state is like your mind is just like very clear in what you need to do like there is no if ands or buts there is no like hesitation no indecisiveness nothing you know like it just tells complete you complete trust yeah, yeah and you do it right and then now your mind doesn't have to overthink it doesn't have because it's all it's already clear you know what you need to do and i think that having that clarity and 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 everything you need to do again like it just allows you to have the potential of not thinking at all. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, you can't go from like overthinking to not thinking at all. It like, that doesn't really work. It's like being very clear in your thoughts first. That's like the first step. Then after that you can, uh, yeah, you can, you can kind of shut out your thoughts. Yeah. Um, and when you say that, I, I remember the last time I hit flow state. it was the most I've ever hit flow state in my life. Um, I went skiing for the first time. Uh, in Korea and or snowboarding so uh, you know I took a lesson first day and I it was like this super easy slope I'm like I'm killing it you know so next day I was like let's go to level two and then level two is like this and I'm looking down mm -hmm. like I could die here like and there's no <laughs> there's no way off the mountain the only way is down it was like late um and I it just I had to do it and the fear of death and like serious damage that adrenaline kicked in and I like you know, I have one day of training. So, but anyways, like I had to do it and I did it. And it was like, I never felt so alive, like so much energy and adrenaline. And it was like, I had no time to think. Like I have, like, I'm like looking down the slope, like making sure I'm hitting the right corners. And I was so present with every single move that I was doing. And there was no time for thinking because otherwise, you know, you're just going so fast. So, you know, in gaming, it's like, it's so fast in real time and you have, 
no time to think. You you have less than a second. If someone peaks a certain way, you see a nade and you have to react properly, right? Like so I think the key thing there is like the 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 practice, the preparation work of uh being in those situations that allows you to be comfortable and natural and confident and have that clarity. So yeah, that um I think it comes down to practice, man. I think it's that Kobe Bryant mentality of gameplay moves at all times whenever you're, it's an actual scrim and not taking any of that for, for granted or playing, you know, loose or sloppy. Yeah, I mean, for sure, like, I remember when I was, when I have played my worst CS and I've played my worst CS probably within the last, like, three years of my career, I've had, like, yeah, I mean... When I say I've played my worst CS, I've I've shown some of, I've had some of my worst games. I'll say that, and it's because you know I'm um, I'm trying to find that flow state, and I'm trying to like practice not thinking at all, practice like playing off my feeling. But at least for me, it doesn't work. Like for me, it's like okay, well, like what am I even doing then? You know, and you try to play without thinking, and and it's like then you're just not thinking about decisions you're making. You know what I mean? Like what like how can you force like playing off feeling? You know, how do you get better playing off feeling? And it's like a question that I can't really answer. I mean, maybe it works for some other people, but for me individually, that's just not like how I'm used to playing, you know? And a lot of the times where I've played in that way, the worst part about playing that way is like it's very inconsistent. And when you start playing poorly, you don't know, like, where you're really, you know, I guess where the mistakes are happening or where you can improve. And, and, um, yeah, I don't know. That's like, that's something that I realized along this, like, journey of, of trying to improve my ceiling. And it's something that I'm thinking, like, one of the thoughts I've been thinking lately is, like, man, I was so much smarter when I was younger and I didn't even know it. You know, like I wasn't as smart when it came to uh, understanding macro or being very conscious or logical. You know, mm. I've obviously gotten better at that over the years, but I was smarter at like not overthinking and not uh, complicating things and not, you know, just, yeah, I think it's like I had to go through all this to know what I need and what I don't need. Yeah. Yeah. It's like there's the logical side and there's a the feeling side and any situation you're in, in, in gaming, it can be a math problem. There is an equation or a way to solve it, right? There's like percentages and there's the logical side where you could break the, literally break the round down by like numbers essentially kind of in a way. And then there's other times where you, there's feeling and gut where it's the low percentage play, but your intuition is telling you, like it's so heavy and it's like you have to you have to make this play and it's like juggling that feeling versus logical play where if you're too logical you're not flowing mm -hmm. if you if you're playing off feeling you're taking gambles and risks and it's it's juggling that and and figuring out how you can use both um and not overdo one or the other and it, yeah. you know the game is so fluid in that way where it just it, it depends on the situation and you know but you know something we've talked about before is well, well the research I've done in flow state is that there needs to be pressure and there needs to be consequences other in order to to hit it if there's nothing to lose it's just whatever like the outcome it doesn't matter but when there is something on the line that that pumps up your adrenaline it makes you try harder and you know, like what I've seen from you is you've always performed on LAN and you do excel when that pressure hits. Um, that could be a reason why maybe, you know, that's why I'd love to see you in more LAN tournaments, playing online. You know, we've, we've talked about this, but playing online is a completely different ball game. Like people are at home, they're in their comfort zone, they're, there's nothing to lose, there's no money on the line, but you know, you're on the third map of a best of three, you know, to get into the playoffs. It's like people start playing a little bit more hesitant. They've tried to force errors. They try to do too much. 
the nerves hit them and but and, and that's what kind of separates you know a playoff team top 18 from the top 20 and so that you know the way I tell people to handle that pressure is like you you have to go through it like you just have to be on stage enough to be comfortable be a public speaker there's that element but there's other other people that like they just excel when it's time to excel and there's a huge x factor there um when it comes to these pressure land tournaments, how would you rate yourself in that situation? Like, and also yeah. who are some players that you've seen take that leap when it really mattered? I think, um, I guess how I would rate, I mean, there are different ways of looking at it. Like for instance, if you look at my recent land stats, they're probably not too great. Um, and, I think the reason why is because like we were somewhat outmatched like if i'm being honest you know like like you could play above your level but only to to a degree you know and i think that um on the recent teams that i've been on we just weren't really ready to be playing at the level that we we're playing at as individuals and as a team yeah exactly the, yeah so i think that that makes it hard for anyone to um and then the second thing is or the second scenario is like we're actually good and like how much of that am i able to show you know when when the time comes and i think with that i'm pretty consistent i would say like i'm probably like an eight or a nine when it comes to like being able to actually show what you know what i'm able to show you know like being able to to play the way that I play in practice or even sometimes play better uh, than how I do in practice. And that's like, yeah, it's funny because when I was focused a lot on like being in the zone or AKA, like I'll call that, I guess, focusing a lot on my floor, my baseline level, I think that I was, um, you know, a lot, I think I was showing a lot like like I was probably a 10 in those scenarios in terms of like showing exactly what I do in practice. But right. when I started chasing this like flow state, I think that number went down to maybe like a seven because, you know, I'm not thinking as much. My decision making isn't as clear because I've been trying not to think. And like, I'm just forcing this on myself when it's, it's really like hard, you know, like it's the opposite of, you know, when I was saying like the tournament starts when I get into the airport and, you know, I'm getting, I'm mad in line and I just embrace it. It's like, you can't like just tell your mind to shut up. You know what I mean? Like you can't like tell your mind not to think when it starts thinking. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like, it runs you, wild. you have no control over your mind. Yeah. Like, like you, yeah. Like it, it's like when you're trying to fall asleep and your mind's racing and you tell your mind like, shut up or like, I'm just not going to think. And then you like close your eyes. But then what do you know? Like two seconds later, it starts thinking and it keeps you up right and it's like it's like that's the thing about flow state is like you can't force your mind not to think and i think that it comes when you kind of accept a lot of your thoughts and and it, it yeah i think it's like the next step from the zone is pretty much what i'm saying yeah um but yeah when i was chasing that i think that i played uh i played a lot worse in, when the time or i think it, it happened both ways i should say like it happened uh i had matches where i was playing really really well and i was kind of in the state the slow state that we're talking about then i had matches where like i couldn't buy a kill and i couldn't come up with a solution on how i could play better i couldn't um i couldn't adjust i couldn't adapt and so yeah i would say that I was i was way more inconsistent when i was chasing that yeah a good point you bring about in terms of team like a match and when you're a newer team playing playing versus a more experienced team, you are generally in worse positions when you're the newer team. So it's hard to find opportunities because you're just at such a disadvantage. If they don't even yeah. go to your site, like you have no choice. So, yeah. um, you know, so that, uh, that matchup 
of individuals and the team, it's like you have to be able to prepare for a match where you give everyone a chance to make an opportunity. And that's when you think when you have like a pretty good strat in a system. Yeah. Like I, yeah. I think there are two things that happen that I've experienced is one, like the round is pretty much checkmate before any kill has happened. Like you're posi positionally at such a disadvantage that every move you make is the wrong move. Mm -hmm. Like you've missed that window of opportunity to kind of make your decision or make your move. And now you're just like, you're screwed pretty much. The only way that you can win those rounds is like individual heroics, but it's very difficult. Good teams won't and, even give you that chance because yeah. yeah, like if you think of like a like a boa constrictor or whatever, like a snake that's just like like you know like has you surrounded and it's just tightening the the knot. Like that's basically how it can feel when you're playing against a team that's better than you. Um, I mean, there's one other scenario. There are three scenarios, I guess. The the second one is like you just get outskilled. Like they literally just like destroy you because of they're like way better than you. Yeah. I don't think that happens that much when it comes to tier one, tier two, because the skill level at that level is pretty like pretty similar. You know what yeah. I mean? Mechanically, for sure. Yeah, mechanically. Um, but yeah, the the third one that I've experienced uh, on a few teams is like you do what you do in practice; it's working, and. For some reason in the match against a better team you think to yourself it's not going to work against them they know it they they know what we're trying to do so then you don't do what you even practice mm. and that is probably the most annoying way to lose um that's the most annoying way to go out because you know it's like what's the point of practicing <laughs> yeah. you know 30 40 hours a, a week or 50 hours a week even and then all of a sudden the time comes to Put it to the test and you don't put it to the test because you already gave them the benefit of the doubt you know you already put yourself on the back foot and um, that's also something that like when you're an inexperienced team and you play against more experienced teams that that is something that i think runs into some people's minds mm -hmm. and um yeah. And yeah i think it's like super super tough i know exactly what you mean um when you feel like you're i remember playing astralis and the peak of their prime and do you, you remember this we on train or? on train and, and we were <laughs> like in boot camp we're like dude we're just gonna auto ban train you know that's the we never scrimmed it once and then we ended up playing it it's kind of like there's you know when you're playing i mean they were just godlike at that period right so you change your game and you try to do too much to revolve around them and it's like they have all this influence and power and that's what it feels like when you're playing a dominant team and you just know it and you do things you're not supposed to do and you, they, they completely have this kind of aura that shadows your whole game plan your thinking process you know it's just like you you know you're at a disadvantage so you have to do too much so and then yeah like you you call stretch you're not supposed to and now it's like you're you're out of whack and like yeah the, the whole team is out of whack you know players are out of whack so um i do think it's important that's why you prepare a game plan and you have these strats ready because those are your go-to bread and butters and we're going to die by it you know and then we'll, we'll figure out afterwards but you start getting the trap of calling all this stuff and it's like then it snowballs and now you're down you know eight zero it's like what 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 the heck just happened already yeah yeah i definitely feel like you know when you're playing when you feel like you're outmatched you definitely there's like an impulse that that um that you get to like do something that's out of character you know because you feel like you need it and i think like for me that's why like discipline is really important like not discipline well i mean discipline in the game of course but discipline in like your life as well because you need to be able to control these impulses like you need to be able to like get the impulse and like let it go you know like you don't have to do the thing that your mind tells you or that uh you think you need to do the irrational and, emotional mindset that just yeah. takes you off rail yeah and like when people think about discipline in cs they think about like oh not going for that 
that second guy when they already got one or not over peaking in this uh you know post one v three v one yeah yeah like they think about it in those terms which that is discipline but for me there's another level of discipline where it's like what we're talking about and it's like like trust trusting you know yourself you know like like these thoughts are coming out of nowhere they're not it's not intuition it's like it's like your insecurities or whatever mm. coming to surface you know and you need to like just let it go and um yeah there are some matches where like where i've you know fallen pressure to this and there are some matches where my teammates have and and um not on energy we haven't really played and we haven't been in this scenario but this was more relevant on eg i would say um but but yeah i think that's like that's pretty tough yeah i remember i played a show match when i had retired for a bit and they just needed someone and i was like oh my gosh my mind was going so crazy i was like so scared to do anything like because i was not confident in my ability i had not played for i didn't know any nades like and then I, so i remember specifically being that mind state where everything i was second guessing I was like, should I hold this angle like this, like this? And it was just like so noisy uh, and, and just getting in my own way. Um, so, you know, I know some people play out there, like I get comments, like people are scared, you know, like e to even play multiplayer games because they're going to let their teammates down. They're like afraid of what they're going to look like to their friends. They don't want to lose. So they trap themselves in this passive mind state where they're not doing anything at all, which is actually not what you want to do. You yeah. know, like when you're too passive, you're giving way too much space. You're not letting anything happen. You're just, you know, and the better team can feel that, you know, like when you play, you know, lesser teams or, you know, beginner teams, you have this confidence about you that you could do anything you want. It's like you take full control of the map. Like it's like there's this freedom with that confidence and both teams can feel it. You could feel it on the losing side and the winning side yeah 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 it's true like i remember we would play matches back when i was on c9 with Stu and Scott on them and we would be losing like really bad like 12 3 half or something and um i just always thought it's gonna be fine like we're still gonna win this game or the scrim or the match or whatever and i've also had the opposite where like we're losing really bad to a team that we should beat i mean it just happened recently and then like you know we're thinking oh we got to do this because they're like beating us and we shouldn't be losing and like you know it's like that you're like freaking out a little bit you know and um yeah i think like those losses or i mean those scenarios you just yeah need to like stay calm you can't like overreact um i mean overreaction is probably like the the i think that's like you know something that you just have to get good at is like not overreacting when shit hits the fan mm -hmm. and like always being like very solution oriented and and um and yeah 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 so i mean i know a long time ago i was looking into meditations by marcus aurelius and i sent you a copy of that just mm -hmm. how awesome it was insightful for me and at that period i was getting into actual meditating in real life um where i would sit quietly by myself with my thoughts and this was like 2019 or something but it was the most grueling and frustrating and annoying thing in the world because i never yeah. done it where i'm literally in silence no phone no music just with my thoughts and it was so tough to do it for like two minutes but yeah. what it helped me realize was that how absolutely noisy the mind is and how no i have no control it's like i'm gonna sit here and just focus on my breath no thoughts and that's it so i would focus on my breath you know oh i, I want to make a smoothie or you know i got to do an errand come back to my breath over and over again and i did that i practiced it for about two or three months i used phone apps to help me different ways and then i got to a point where i was able to consciously know when my thoughts were going off and and be aware of it and then go back to whatever i choose to think about so i choice over my or awareness of my thoughts and then how I reacted to it and you know I'm I'm a, a chronic I used to be a chronic overthinker you know 
anxiety, overthinking, all that kind of stuff, you know. Um, but now I'm, I have control over my mind because I can, I'm aware of my thoughts at all times. And before mm -hmm. I would let a negative thought think about, oh, I got to make this smoothie and then I got to go to the grocery store and get the bananas, but then I have to get gas. And it's like, it takes me down this path. And sometimes I'll think minutes at a time of some random thought in the future, you know, and I would just lose my mind. I didn't even know it was happening until I started practicing meditation, being aware of my thoughts and being conscious and understanding it and knowing that I can at any point discard a thought and then do whatever I was doing, you know, another thought would pop up and then, but then I was aware and it yeah. actually made my life a lot more peaceful that way where I'm not always overthinking, you know? So instead of like the 70,000 thoughts that people have a day now, like maybe it's like 10,000 now. So there's yeah. these lap moments of just quiet and peace and uh, you know, how to tie that back into gaming is like if you have that overthinking mind and you're just always juggling thoughts it's noisy it's like draining it's draining it's all this you know it actually takes calories to think so you're unnecessarily burning all this brain and focus and energy and battery that is finite every day so yeah um yeah i mean like the first step is being aware that you're having a thought and then consciously discarding it and then being able to think about the positive and helpful thoughts, uh, I think translates into like performance in gaming. Yeah, I mean, like, I remember when I started opping, um, I would have, I would be holding an angle and there are two ways that I'd be holding the angle. One way is like, I'm just holding it. I'm just like, I'm, I just have my cross replaced. I'm just ready. The other was, you know, okay, what if he jiggles me? If he jiggles me, oh shoot, should I shoot on this jiggle? What if he wide swings me though? Then I got to place my crosser here. What if they double peek me? How am I going to get out? And like, I'd be thinking all this stuff and then someone peek me and I'm dead. And it's <laughs> like, it's like, well, I'm thinking about all this and then versus, you know, the other scenario where I'm just holding it, I'm just like, I'm just ready for whatever, you know, like, like they jiggle me. Okay. Well, I'll just wait, you know, like I'll, like if he peeks me, he's dead. They double peek me. Okay. I'll get yeah, one and get out. You know, like that's, that's kind of, you know, that was kind of how I would think about it. And, um, and it was just kind of like, I'm ready for whatever, you know, like, yeah, like, uh, I'm not like freaking out about everything. I'm, I'm just holding the angle and, and you peek me, you're dead. That's like how I thought about it. And, um, you know, I think like I had a lot of, you know, what you're describing, it happened to me a lot, especially when I was trying to sleep, like this, my sleep has been a constant like issue throughout my career. I would go like months and months with like three, four hours wow. of sleep. I would play like, especially when I was on the road, I would average probably like three hours of sleep. Um, but yeah, I didn't really meditate, but all I did was I would kind of meditate when I was like trying to sleep. Like, you know, thoughts are coming in, letting them go. Thoughts are coming in, you know, and I would just keep doing that and like bringing it back to the breath. And um, yeah, I think all that really helps. And yeah, I think, you know, it just goes back to, to what my climbing coach said, which is like, you have a plan, you just like have the plan and execute it. It doesn't matter. Like, it doesn't matter what the plan is, if it's good or bad, you just do it because that's like how you're gonna learn. Um, and that's also a, a way to quiet the mind, you know, is just being decisive and like taking action. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that um, situation you mentioned about holding the angle, because um, it is easy to be like reactionary and have a backup plan. It's like, yeah, I'm gonna hold an angle, and if I see a flash, I'm gonna turn, and then if, if, if there's you know two people white swing, I won't even shoot, whatever. Um, but the key thing I think there was like just being present instead of in your mind, because when you're in your mind, you're thinking about the future. You're thinking about all these what ifs. And then mm -hmm. you're thinking about these what ifs, you're not present, you're not locked in right there, ready to react. So you lose precious half second, even a full second of reaction time, where you're just like, okay, I'm gonna sit here. And then maybe you might think about, okay, I need to aim this much if they jiggle, or maybe if they wide swing, I, you know, so you calculate that distance of mechanical movement. But um, yeah, man, but when you start, when you're overthinking, you're in la la land, you're thinking about what ifs, fears, anxieties, all this stuff that hasn't happened yet and you're not even allowing your present self to be there so 
that that's the, the problem with the noisy mind is it takes you away from the moment and being here and now and like in the present moment so i i, I yeah. think yeah I, I think it's one of those things where you know i learned later in life but if i learned earlier in life i think i think that for sure would help me a little bit yeah i also think you know i heard i forget where i heard this but i heard that focus is kind of like it's a muscle so you you know if I'm holding an angle and I need to be focused for a minute straight. I'm probably going to fall asleep on that angle. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And, you know, I think there are times where you could be thinking and then times where you need to like, like lock in real fast, you know, for like literally five seconds. And then after that, you can go back to think. And um, I think being aware of those moments is like really important. And you watch any great player, you know, you watch simple he chooses his moments really well. And in those specific moments where he's getting that 3K highlight, that 4K highlight, guarantee you he's not thinking anything. Mm -hmm. But it's because he, like, chose that moment, you know? Like, leading yeah. up to it, he's probably thinking a lot, you know? Like, where's the other team going? Oh, they just threw this. Um, and then, you know, the scenario that I described where you're holding the angle and you're, like, thinking about all these what-ifs, that's, like, the worst of it all, you know what I mean? Like, like you're you're not thinking about the right things for one, Two, you're like in a very important moment, but you're not present. And three, I mean, you're just gonna die doing that, right? And you're gonna lose in the round. So, so I think like that's another um, important factor is like knowing when to kind of zone in. Yeah, that's a great point. That and I and I see that too, and because that's why you see so many simple highlights. It's like when it is time to execute these string of two or three like crazy shots like he's so locked in yeah it seems like that's i mean obviously he was you know one of the best players of all time and you know it's, it's like he's on adderall like 50 milligrams when it's time to matter or whatever he's just so locked in and he never misses um yeah yeah and these glimpses of intense focus that he always execute on and Obviously, if you if you have that intensity the entire round, or you're just holding an angle, it can be draining. But it's like, yeah, being able to snap in and out of that, like he like he cho chooses his moments, and then he just executes perfectly every time. Yeah, I've had you know moments where I'm trying to like really focus on my aim and like really focus on, um, like basically trying to be focused for like a minute long. And what always happens when I try to do that is that I lose sight of everything that's happening like my overall in-game awareness goes down tunnel vision oh, I'm, yeah like oh i missed that this guy killed him and that's the b lurk so b should be clear because he was there you know and and i like when i'm able to like snap in and out of this focus it's like i'm able to also keep an overview of what's happening within the round you know um and i think that's like part of being a good player you know being part of a good player is like is all of the above yeah that that's a great point i remember when i was playing some of my best it's like half the time i'm not even looking at my crosshair i'm like looking at the 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 radar you know yeah. it's like when i when i have those times to focus it's like there's i'm opening the channels to all the information my awareness is so wide but i'm also yeah. locked in you know on my screen it's like obviously if you're just too focused on your aim you lose sight of comms and you know yeah. sound and all the other information yeah i watched your uh i think it's called glassing your glassing video from like a while back where like you can zone in your fov on like you know like you can use your vision to zone in on something but then you can also broaden it out and it's like you need to be able to do that when it comes to like just your focus you know like your your um your mental focus yeah yeah just for those of you who haven't seen it um i wanted to go hunting um just to you know exercise getting my own food i never did it but i got my license and i was studying and i got like a rifle with a scope and one of the things they taught was glassing and it's a technique where you're able to like widen your vision so you're on a mountaintop or a hill you could see the entire landscape and pick out any movement and go hunt but then you're also able to focus your vision onto literally a pixel or a dot or a piece of tree, you know, and like on that deer. So that that juggling of your vision also applies to your awareness and your focus. And I know so many gamers out there that do tunnel vision on just like 
It's like, dude, I just like called for your backup. You know, uh, you know, they're, they're not even listening to comms because they're so focused on right there and their mechanics. But yeah, like when when I play my best, I'm just so aware. Like everything is, it feels effortless. I'm I'm able like the analogy. Another video that I had was like driving. So when you first learn to drive, you're like you know, focused on the wheel, the pedal, you know, and like just basic mechanics. But then you have to like check your, you know, rear view mirror. You got to check your blind spots. You got to check what's on the road, speed limit, red light, green light in front of you. There's so much information you have to juggle. But then you get to a point where you can eat hamburgers while you're driving and seeing at the same time. It's like because all those little mechanical things that you're you know stressing about before is natural. So your awareness of everything that's going on in that environment is um, it's easy because you've just done it so many times. And I think yeah. beginner gamers, like at first are so focused on crosshair and maybe recoil or like basic movement mechanics, you know, hitting buttons for their nades. And that's taking up all their focus that they're not even able to, uh, can apply to awareness of what's going on. Their teammates, you know, you know, predicting the enemy move, uh, players and stuff. So there is so much information to juggle when you're playing the game beyond mechanics and that that. When you're at a super high level, when your awareness can intake all this info and process it live without taking away from the focus from your mechanics, that's when you're like elite status, when right? everything is natural and you know you, you you could play all the variables and factors of the game um, together at once, you know, harmoniously. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. All right, man. Is there uh, any other? T okay. How are you improving on yourself outside the game? Um, I definitely think climbing is like a big thing for me right now. Um, I always think, so I think that, um, you know, when I was younger in my career, I had this mentality, like, it's all about the game. I didn't do anything outside the game. I didn't hang out with my friends. I barely hung out with my family. Um, didn't have any hobbies, nothing. And I was just all about the game and, and it got me to a really good point. And I've like, I've thought about, um, as I've gotten older, I've thought about like, maybe I need to go back to that, like being only about the game. But I think that it's hard to take the approach that got you somewhere um, and like do it over again. You know, like it, what, hap what worked once might not work again. A different period of your life. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And um, so while I still put in a lot of time, I think that climbing has really helped me because there's this other thing that I I'm not so good at that I can uh, that I can learn and that I can develop myself within and then I can take all the things that I learned while doing that and apply it to you know CS and that's been like a big thing like a lot of the things that we talked about like in this um, in this uh, video it's it's like a lot of them stemmed from like things that were happening in climbing. And I was thinking like, oh shit, like I, you know, I've been going like months and months doing this, like thinking too much, for instance, or like, you know, being too indecisive um, when I should just be decisive. And it's like, that happened because, you know, I'm a noob climber and someone pointed it out to me and I'm, I'm taking that and I'm like cross-referencing my experience in cs and then you know uh yeah so i mean just like that helps me develop as a person which then helps me develop as a cs player you know yeah yeah i think that beginner mindset where you're learning something new um it helps you relearn how to learn it's almost yeah, exactly. like yeah so it's like in i've only climbed once but it's very technical like on the wall, you have all these colored blocks or whatever, these handholds, and you can only, like some some routes, you can only hold, you can only use the red ones. So you're looking up there and you're like, how, how on earth can I get from here to there by only using the red ones? And it's this puzzle, you know, it's this uh, puzzle of how to maneuver yourself and get yourself to that position. But if you're overthinking too much, you're not confident in how you're gonna position your arm and hand, your uh, not committed and then you fall or you just waste too much energy just sitting there not moving yeah um when your natural athleticism and ability 
you know, like the monkey inside of you, 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 you could just, if you just went with it, like you you would naturally flow. But if you're just yeah. trying to like, tut, 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 peace, 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 you're, I mean, like you're, it's like driving with your foot on the pedal and the gas pad. You're just, yeah. you're not, you're not, you're never letting yourself go. You're just, tut, 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 tut. yeah, it's definitely, it, it's definitely very similar to CS uh, mentally because it's, it is a balance between like, how do I let myself just like move freely and let my body do what it wants to do? And, you know, when my body does what it wants to do, but it doesn't work because, you know, the, you know, it, I don't know, the movement that I wanted to do doesn't work. Like, how do I, how do I figure out why it didn't work? How do I figure out, okay, well, what do I need to do instead? And then retraining your, your body you know, to do something differently. And that trains your intuition, that trains, um, yeah. I mean, that, that's pretty much like the main thing that I do outside of uh, gaming. Um, I also will like watch TV shows and stuff like to, <laughs> just to- What are you watching? Right now I'm watching Invincible. It's like a, I don't know if you've heard of it. It's mm -hmm. like a animated show uh, about like a superhero that, is like going through all these issues but i don't know i'll watch shows not to like not to enjoy them but like actually to try to like see like what the problems are that they're facing and, and what they're doing yeah um, just take your mind off yeah yeah you got to give your mind a break to just relax yeah not process exactly. yeah i mean that that's like the main stuff and then i mean this isn't necessarily outside of gaming but i'm doing a lot of aim training as well um, I know that you're like big into the aim training community and stuff. So I'm part of, do, or I'm part of Amped. Uh, I've been doing that for about six weeks now. What, what is Amped? Oh, Amped is a, uh, so Voltaic. Yeah. Um, they have this program called Amp that basically like, it's only available to pro players and they'll basically do like a very in-depth eight week long, like coaching session, uh, with you and they'll like, you know, watch your VODs. I guess, um, tell you what's wrong with your aim and then come up with some sort of, uh, plan on how you can improve. Yeah. I've been doing that and it's been, I think very helpful. And I, on top of that, I think like aim trainers, it's going to be the equivalent to going to the gym as a pro athlete, you know, like if you're not going to the gym as a pro athlete, you're probably not going to have a very long career. You know, your natural ability can only last you so long. Um, yeah, there whereas, you have like, to maintain. Exactly. Yeah, and you see like LeBron playing till I don't even know how old he is. Thirty eight, almost thirty nine. Yeah, something. it's ridiculous. Twenty years. Yeah, he's pretty old, and you know everyone will say he's the guy that's in the gym all the time. Uh, so yeah, I've been doing a lot of aim training, um, trying to be very. When I say a lot, I mean not doing like hours and hours a day, but just you know, 45 minutes a day and just doing that every single day over the course of, you know, a month, three months, six months, a year, like that's all going to compound a lot. Yeah. So that's like kind of what I've been trying to do. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's like pretty much it. Just trying to live my life in the way that I would play CS. <laughs> like it sounds like crazy, but you know, um, just trying to be somewhat disciplined, trying to, you know, let things go when, when, uh, when I can't control them. And yeah. yeah, that's awesome, man. I mean, even at your level, you're always trying to improve, which is the awesome part. Um, I just want to, let's go ahead and in the, the chat here, I have some rapid fire questions. Okay. Maybe one, you know, one word, one sentence. Um, outside yeah. of Counter-Strike and Valorant, your favorite game of all time, the one that just, you know, brings back memories, maybe the ones you spent the most time in or the one you found most uh, unique. Starcraft. For Starcraft 1? Yeah, I played Brood War, though. Brood War? Okay, which race? I was, uh, I was a Protoss player. Okay. What about Protoss? I, what, then, well, that's just the one that my cousin taught me. Okay. He, like, taught me how to play Protoss. You're, you're a cannon then, rusher. No, no, I didn't. <laughs> okay. But, uh, but yeah, I liked Protoss, but then when I watched, like, I think, I know Boxer was one, of, there was another, uh, 
Terran player that I really like. I think Select. Yeah, it was Select. Select, yeah. He, yeah. When I watched them play Terran, I was like, man, this is actually like the race that I want to play. Mm -hmm. But uh, I never got good with them. So Yeah, I was but, a yeah, Terran Starcraft. player. I, I yeah. love the mechanical part of them. Yeah, where yeah, the other yeah. ones are more exactly. organic. You know? Yeah. yeah. Um, favorite mouse of all time? Other than the one oh, you're using now. That's a tough one. I mean, just the G Pro. I'm not using that right now. I'm using the Death Adder V3, but G Pro I used for like like four years or something, five yeah, years. So. Yeah, it's a solid one. Uh, favorite map? In Counter Strike and Valorant. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, Valorant, that's easy. Ascent. I think Ascent's my favorite map. Yeah. It's, it's the most balanced. similar to SCS map, I would yeah. say. Um, CS, I would say uh, maybe Mirage. Oh, man. Okay. Yeah, just a classic. Gosh, I have that band, dude. It played too much. <laughs> um, favorite gaming weapon outside of Counter-Strike and Valorant? Like like a gun that's just super cool that like you would have to have love to have in real life. You know, I, I don't really play that many games outside of CS. Um so it's tough, but I'll just say uh Is it a rifle or a sniper gun? I, I would say a sniper. Just the op in, in Valorant. Yeah. Or like Widowmaker's gun, whatever she used. Uh which game takes more smarts, Valorant or Counter Strike? uh i mean i'm gonna upset a lot of people with this one but i think i think cs i think cs because valorant is more like it's built into the built into the game so to speak you know like you play an agent that's your role that's like you know what i mean um whereas cs everyone can do anything but it's up to you to understand what it is your job is within a certain round or team or scenario that makes sense um favorite streamer um Tarek. Tarek, yeah, he's fun to watch. I have like I'm sub to him for eighty two months. I just canceled my sub. Why? He stopped thanking me, dude. Like <laughs> Oh, okay, yeah. No, <laughs> no, no I'm love back. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Okay. Um out of all the gamers that you've seen, whose gameplay do you respect the most? Do I respect? Yeah. Device. Device. Yeah, yeah, I think Device is another one of those guys who, like, maximized what he had. Um, you know, like, I... Okay, like, I don't think... When you watch him, he's not very flashy. He's not, like, crazy. Hits his shots. But I know there's a lot going on, like, in between the ears. You know what I mean? There's there's a lot of work being done in the mental side of things, I think. And um, he's not flashy, like I said. He doesn't have crazy flicks. Nothing like that. But he's, like, on point all the time. He's textbook. Yeah, he's textbook. He's not a simple. It just pulls stuff out of his butt at times. But he plays by the book, and he's always at the right place at the right time, and he hits the shots when he needs to. That's what it looks yeah. like. Yeah, yeah. I mean, no, that makes sense. I mean, when they're when Astralis was on that run, he was a huge fat. He was like the best. So yeah, yeah. Um, which player have you watched the most of in terms of demos and studying? I think Nico probably. Nico, yeah. Just because he was really good in CSGO. I mean, he's been good for a long time, right? Like, pretty much my whole time I've been playing CS, he's been good the whole time. So, yeah. I've watched his demos over the course of, like, nine years. So, probably him. Cool, man. All right. Well, uh, any, like, shout-outs or any kind of last comments you want to say? Uh, No. I mean, thanks for for having me here. Really appreciate the, the talk after a long time. Thanks to NRG and my team and and that's that's it cool yeah whenever we meet up you know we'll, we'll hit the golf range or you can show okay. me how to climb okay all right yeah. man